Uh, in a periodic inventory system, the company doesn't worry about determining cost of goods sold or the cost of the ending inventory until the end of the accounting period. So costs are accumulated during the period, and then at the end of the period, we determine how much of the cost belongs in cost of goods sold and how much belongs in the ending inventory balance. In the example here, we see that during the month of January, the company started with 100 units in the beginning inventory and had a cost of $5 each, and then during January bought another 200 at $6 and then another 300 at 7 So we have 600 units available for sale during the month of January, and the total cost of all those units is 3800 Now it's the end of the month, and at the end of the month we see that we sold 300 units, and therefore we have 300 left, and now it's time to determine what the cost of the units sold and the cost of the ending inventory balance is. The question then is, how do we divide up this $3,800 between cost of goods sold and ending inventory balance? Now, if during the period one price was paid for all the units, then this wouldn't be an issue. Uh, we would have 300 units sold, and we'd multiply by whatever that price was, and that would be cost of goods sold. We have 300 units left in the ending inventory, multiply by that one cost, and that would give us the balance in ending inventory. But now, we have costs changing as we go through the month, so the issue becomes which units were sold and which units are left in the ending inventory. We have three different approaches to use here to answer that question. And one is called FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. And under the FIFO method, the units sold are assumed to be the first ones that were available for sale. So under first in, first out, the 100 units in the beginning inventory would be the first units sold, and then another 200 would have been sold, and they would be the units that we spent $6 each for. So under FIFO, cost of goods sold, will be the 100 units at $5 per unit and 200 units at $6 per unit, a total of $1,700. The ending inventory then is the 300 units left that we paid $7 each for. So under our FIFO approach, the ending inventory balance would be $2,100 and we've now divided up the $3,800 between cost of goods sold, $1,700, and ending inventory 2100. But FIFO isn't the only method available to us. We could also use LIFO. And under LIFO, we reverse the FIFO assumption. Now it's last in, first out. So the last units in, the 300 that we paid $7 each for, would be the units that we would assume were sold. This is a little unrealistic since we didn't receive these units until January 20th, but that's all right. Under generally accepted accounting principles, we're allowed to make the assumption that the first units sold were the last units received. And that means then that the cost of goods sold will be $2,100, and the units that are left are the 200 at 6 and the 100 at 5. So the cost of the ending inventory is $1,700, and we've now divided up the $3,800 using our LIFO approach in exactly the opposite way that we did it under FIFO. Now cost of goods sold is $2,100, and ending inventory is $1,700. Uh, let's note a couple of things here. If you were using FIFO, then one advantage in using FIFO is that the ending inventory balance you determine will represent the last cost paid. Uh, if we're interested in reporting a realistic figure for the inventory on the balance sheet, namely current market price, then FIFO will allow us to do that. However, we also have the lowest cost of goods sold recorded under FIFO. This might create a distortion on our income statement in that we'd be reporting current sales revenue but cost of goods sold would represent prices paid in the past. That might inflate our profit figure from the sales since current sales price would reflect current cost and be higher probably than sales price was previously. 
Uh, under LIFO, we have the highest cost of goods sold. So now we might be doing a better job of matching up current cost against sales revenue, but we also then would report the lowest ending inventory figure. And ending inventory here would represent costs from long ago and probably wouldn't have a lot to do with current market value for the inventory. Well, I hope you feel more confident now about your ability to calculate inventory balances and cost of goods sold under LIFO and FIFO. Understanding the differences between the two systems and their impact upon the financial reports is something else. It's something that students always struggle with, but they shouldn't. The concepts are really pretty simple. Let's summarize them. As we saw in our example, in a period of rising prices, FIFO has the advantage of stating the inventory at something close to current market values. LIFO, though, states the inventory at long ago costs that may have nothing to do with current market values. FIFO determines cost of goods sold based on those historical costs. And since they may not represent current prices, the cost of goods sold number will be understated and gross profit and net income will be overstated. LIFO has the advantage of stating cost of goods sold at the current and highest costs. That guarantees that the cost of goods sold number will be the highest number and therefore gross profit and net income will be the lower figures. The principle of conservatism supports the use of LIFO in this case. However, LIFO creates an opportunity for management to manipulate the income statement. Let's take a look at an example and see how this is done. Let's say you're the manager of the business that we've just looked at and the sales estimates for the upcoming month of February are for 300 units. As we know you presently have 300 units in your inventory and under LIFO they're composed of the $5 units and the $6 units. Well you have 300 units in inventory and the estimate for sales are for 300 units so you might want to buy another hundred units just to make sure you don't stock out during the month of February. The problem is prices have gone up even further and now these units cost eight dollars each. But if you purchase them then you'll have 400 units available and if the sales are indeed 300 units in the month of February and if the current selling price is ten dollars per unit then you'll report three thousand dollars of sales for February. The cost of goods sold under LIFO will be 100 units at $8 per unit plus 200 units at $6 per unit, a total of $2,000 for cost of goods sold. That will give you a gross profit of $1,000. But suppose, being an unscrupulous manager, you realize that there's an opportunity for you here to report even more profit from these sales. The way you can do it is by simply not buying any new units during the month of February. Now we would have zero units purchased at eight dollars per unit and if the number of units sold is actually 300 during February then you'll have a reported income statement that looks like so under alternative two. Sales will still be three thousand dollars but now the cost of goods sold will be 200 units at six dollars plus 100 units at five a total of seventeen hundred and that'll give you gross profit of thirteen hundred instead of a thousand. By using LIFO a pool of units is formed in the inventory that all carry costs from long ago and if prices have been rising these costs will be much lower than current market values. An unscrupulous manager can distort cost of goods sold and inflate the gross profit figure by simply not restocking inventory. Of course this is not ethical and it's not something that any manager should do, but it creates the opportunity for management to liquidate the LIFO reserve that has been formed of these lower historical costs and in so doing inflate the reported income figure for the current period. Again the company should use the method LIFO or FIFO that it believes does the best job of fully reflecting the true profitability and financial position of the company. 
Either method is acceptable, but there's also another that we can use. Under the average cost method, rather than assuming first in, first out, or last in, first out, we assume that the inventory was sold evenly from all the different purchases that we made during the period, and therefore the ending inventory is also evenly distributed among all those purchases. We cost the goods sold, and we cost the ending inventory at the average price paid for the goods during the period. In order to determine that, all we need to do is calculate a simple average cost, and if we take our $3,800 total cost for all the units available for sale, and divide by the 600 units that we had available, then the cost per unit is an average of six and two-thirds dollars each. And then to determine the cost of the goods sold, all I would do is multiply the 300 units sold by this average price, and to uh, come up with the ending inventory, I do the same thing. I have 300 units left in the ending inventory, so I'll multiply by the average price, and I'll get $1,900 for both cost of goods sold and ending inventory. So once again, we've divided up the total cost of $3,800, and we did it this time evenly through all the layers, and because we had 300 units sold and 300 units left in the ending inventory, we're going to wind up dividing that $3,800 evenly between cost of goods sold and ending inventory. Average cost then becomes kind of a middle ground, and if we have consistently rising prices for inventory, as is the case here, or we have consistently falling prices, then average cost will give us cost of goods sold and ending inventory values that are somewhere between the LIFO and the FIFO extremes.